fact that they're, um, you know, that they don't have all these problems. Well, one, it's because their user base is so much smaller. But the, all the time, there are data uh, holes found in their web browsers as well and in their, uh, in their operating system. And they take quite a while to fix, too. So having a secure web browser, uh, Microsoft Internet Explorer 7 or higher, uh, we've been pushing all of our customers to 7 that, are, that aren't there yet. Um, Internet Explorer 8 came out. Uh, it's even better. Um, some compatibility, compatibility issues out there, so you know you, you might have some good luck with 8. You might not yet, uh, but it takes even further steps on being more secure than uh, previous browsers did. Uh, an Internet monitoring system. Um, this is you know either a piece of software or a hardware device that goes in that everybody, you know, all the web browsing traffic kind of flows through it, and it's just watching what happens. And you can do a lot with these systems. You can set them just to monitor what's going on, and you can look at the reports later so you get a good idea, and you can, you can talk to individuals. You can choose to block uh, only bad stuff, you know, the, the gambling, the adult, the things that are known to have, uh, the spywares. You know, or you can restrict only to what you think is going to be work-related. Um, and again, you can choose to block or you can choose to monitor. Uh, these are solutions that are usually very, very flexible. Um, they even have things where you can slow down certain types of traffic. If you're going to let people shop, you can slow the, tra uh, the shopping traffic down so the people that are actually doing work um, have the priority on your Internet. And antivirus and anti-malware protection. Um, most people, when they get a spyware infection, their first question is, hey, why did my antivirus stop that? And hopefully I answered that earlier by saying that they are two totally different things. That viruses are something that sneaks themselves into files and alters files. Um, and uh, the malware is an actual program that is installed on the computer. Now, some of the antivirus companies have anti-spyware and anti-malware stuff built in. It's usually, it's usually not as good as uh, the dedicated stuff. There's some free programs out there. There are a lot of, um, you know, a lot of them that are just built on scanning. Um, but think about running something that's actually installed on the computer all the time. Yes, it might slow things down a pinch, but so did antivirus when we installed it. And everybody finally understands that you just have to have antivirus. You can't do without it. And the anti-malware is kind of getting that way. So if you go out and you download the, the latest anti-malware program and you scan it, you scan your computer and it cleans stuff, you know, that's good. But that doesn't mean you've got anti-malware protection. That's like getting a virus and then cleaning it versus stopping the virus before it comes in. <clears throat> Having a proper firewall, uh, I mentioned earlier, is very important. You want a firewall that does something called stateful packet inspection. And basically that's a fancy term for a firewall that's smart enough to look at the traffic and know it's okay. Uh, whenever you see an insurance company or somebody else send out an email saying that we're moving to a new data center and please open these ports in your firewall. You don't have to do that if you have a stateful packet inspection firewall because your firewall is smart enough to know that you're requesting this traffic so let it come back. You don't need to open ports for those. Whenever you have to open a port, it's a pretty unsophisticated firewall. So you want to make sure you have one of these stateful packet inspections. This way, you, one, you don't have to open the port, but two, the stuff coming back in, it knows how to read it to verify that it was similar to what was being asked for, and that's the expected answer. Otherwise, if you just open a port in your firewall, that stuff is free to flow freely. And hackers are always going to try to sneak stuff in, in a whole bunch of good-looking stuff. You want a firewall that's got a big, uh, big built-in list of attack signatures. Um, firewalls don't just stop the, uh, the stuff coming in from open and closed ports. All the time, um, and being port scanned is just one of them, all the time you're probably being attacked. You've probably heard about some of these on the news if you ever hear something called a denial of service attack or a sin flood attack or a DNS attack. Firewalls know how to block these things and make them stop happening. Because if somebody does one of these attacks, they might have one or ten or a thousand or a million computers all at once just trying to overload your firewall to the point where it finally gives up and, and lets stuff in. Um, adequate processing power is a key one, uh, one that's not often thought about, but the, the less expensive your firewall, the, the slower the firewall processor is and the less memory it's going to have. 
meaning that it could potentially be a bottleneck on your network. Unfortunately, we see a lot of people that, that get these. If you get anyone, anyone from a store, you're going to have an in, inadequately uh, uh, processing powered firewall. Um, they also lack a lot of the other features that you have. If your internet provider says, you know, they, they give you a, a DSL modem and say that it's a firewall too, it's really not the, the proper level of firewall that we're talking about here. And then packet filtering. Um, you know, this is the, the, base, the base of a firewall. Most things do this nowadays, um, but you want to make sure you've got a packet filtering firewall too. Um, the recommended firewall that we, um, we do like to see is the Cisco ASA series. Uh, this here is the ASA 5505 line and the, the 5505 or 10 or 20. Those are just based on different size requirements and, and different needs based on how fast your internet is and how many people you have. Uh, these are the firewalls that are the newer versions of the Cisco Pixis. Um, there are a lot of other firewalls out there that are that are decent. Um, you know, watch guards, um, fireboxes, sonic walls. Um, but we find that, uh, that they are, even though they have a lot of advanced features, um, definitely uh, less powerful than the Cisco. Usually also you have to pay for a lot of the extras that the Cisco has built in. So they do end up costing more in the long run. Now switching gears and talking about protecting yourself from employees, we've gone over a lot about protecting yourself from the internet. 62% of data breaches uh, were attributed to significant internal errors. And what that could mean is people with you know weak passwords, people doing stuff that they shouldn't have. Plain and simple. Uh, the majority of data breaches originate from internal sources um, as a result of the enterprise's inability to enforce their IT policies or due to problems with policies themselves. The biggest problem we see with policies is people that don't have them. Um, again, you want, you know, the, your use policy should be for the internet just like it is for business stuff. Um, you don't need your uh, personal lines people getting into HR stuff. So your um, acceptable computer usage policy should say only, you're only allowed to access data that's needed for your job function. And, and keep it that simple. You have to actually set things up to work that way too, but need to have that in a policy. So to make that actually happen, you've got to think of what does your data actually consist of? Um, is there uh, sensitive information like life and health that is gonna fall under some of these uh, other data acts? Um, the newest one out is high tech, uh, which does have some pretty stringent rules on uh, communicate, uh, electronic communication of personal information. So in this case, uh, where you would fall under high tech, does your data consist of sensitive information such as social security numbers, credit card information? Um, does your data not really matter? Is it just uh, uh, people's names and numbers and, and uh, VIN numbers? Does everybody actually need access to those VIN numbers? Uh, do you need access to the, everybody's, you know, whatever you can think of? But you need to think, what does your data consist of? Because I'm sure not everybody needs access to everything. Uh, where is your data? Uh, is your data all being stored on a server? Uh, are you having people put their important data in a public directory? Or are they putting it in a secure directory that only they have access to? Uh, is your data in SharePoint? Uh, and is that SharePoint site restricted security-wise? Uh, is your data in Outlook public folders? What about the security there? Are they keeping stuff in their own Outlook? Uh, if they're keeping it in Outlook, are they doing archiving so it's not really in the server anymore, it's local? So you can see, again, there's lots to think about about where your data is, because it can be in a lot of different places. Who can access it? Uh, again, uh, you know, kind of what we've already covered. Um, and can users take data? And people usually say, well, what do you mean can they take it? This a little bit relates to the security on the go also where, you know, do people have CD burners in their computers? Uh, are the USB ports enabled? Can they use USB sticks? It would be very, very easy and kind of scary of how much information you could get by walking into a computer uh, if your computer doesn't lock and need a password to unlock. You know, somebody goes to the bathroom, a, a customer could be in the office, you know, quickly sit down, stick a USB key in, and if they know what they're doing,